the bow of Robin Hood. It's the bow of the archers of old England. For thousands of years, the horse archers of the Asian steppes dominated the continent. The crossbow had a rather bad reputation, at least in England. Anybody could pick it up and be reasonably effective quite quickly. The longbow was the most significant English weapon of the Middle Ages, and the remarkable men who shot it were famed and feared throughout Europe. For centuries, it dominated warfare. Today, the bow is a sophisticated piece of engineering. The principle's the same, but the design has changed almost beyond recognition. These bows have every technological advantage. The bow sling aids the grip. The carbon fiber arrows are wind tunnel tested for accuracy. A trigger release keeps the fingers free of the bowstring during the critical moment of loosing. A sophisticated sight is preset to keep the archer's aim spot on target. The extent of the draw is controlled by a draw check. And to prevent the bow moving in the hand, a stabilizer is fitted. All add consistency to the archer's shooting. Drawing the bow is made much easier with a series of interconnecting cams, part of a gearing system that helps the drawstring to be pulled with very little physical effort. And a spirit level shows when the bow is vertical. These complex sporting bows have progressed to the limits of modern science, but their inspiration is set firmly in the past. The ancient wooden bow a superb example of the application of simple technology. Wood is naturally springy. It has to be to survive. It bends with the wind and flexes back into shape. As soon as early man discovered this, he tried to harness this power to his own advantage. And one of the earliest ways he did this was by means of the bow. Cave paintings show how early man was able to combine complex and separate technologies, bow, bowstring and arrow, into an efficient and deadly hunting weapon. The bow is an extremely ancient weapon. It goes back to Neolithic times, at least 3000 BC. It's the first attempt by man to convert his own natural strength and energy to a mechanical weapon. Basically, the bow is a spring, a simple spring. In the first case, it was made of wood. Just a piece of wood. Well, not quite. It had to be the right sort of wood, cut and fashioned in the right way. Great thought and skill went into the making of apparently simple wooden bows. For thousands of years, the wooden bow was the supreme weapon for hunting and for war. If the English longbow was remarkable, so were the men who shot it. In their hands, the longbow had a formidable reputation. This is the bow of Robin Hood. It's the bow of the archers of old England. It's the bow of the Western world. It was efficient, it was strong, and moreover, it was cheap and easy to use. This one is special in as much as it's made from yew wood, which gives it an additional elasticity and strength. If you look at the wood itself, you can see there's a dark band on the belly side and a light band on the back. The white wood on the back is very elastic and the dark wood on the belly resists compression delightfully. So you get an extremely efficient bow. But there was much, much more to the wooden longbow than its simple but awesome efficiency. It was its feared accuracy in the hands of the English yeoman that secured the weapon's reputation on the medieval battlefield and the archer his place in history. There's something distinctively English, although I should say Anglo-Welsh, about the medieval archer. 
In part, that's because the bow isn't just a weapon, but it's a social system designed to support that weapon. This particular bow has a draw weight of around 100 pounds. I can't begin to draw it effectively. In order to use this properly, a man would have to train for years, every weekend, shooting at the butts in his village or town. It can shoot these broadhead arrows for large game or at unprotected men, and arrows like this at armoured targets. There's still real doubt as to how effective a bow like this actually was against armour. But I believe that an archer who could get a dozen arrows in the air within a minute was going to be able to put a sheer wall of arrows in the front of advancing armoured knights and to do them real damage. During the 14th and 15th centuries, the French faced English archers en masse in a prolonged conflict between the two countries. In a number of famous battles, the French suffered humiliating defeats. At Crecy in 1346, the French attacked mostly on horseback and lost. At Poitiers, the French knights attacked on horseback and on foot and lost again. Then, in 1415, King Henry V of England invaded France with an army, 80% of which were archers. The scene was set for the most famous battle of them all. Henry had besieged and taken the port of Harfleur, but it had been a costly victory. He had lost many soldiers to wounds and disease. Dysentery spread like wildfire. With his depleted army, he set out to march north to Calais. He could have sailed straight home, but he didn't. Perhaps he wanted to reinforce his claim to France by marching through it. Almost certainly he thought he could avoid battle. But the French were angry and massed enormous forces against him. River crossings on the short route up the coast were well defended, and so Henry's bedraggled little army was forced inland towards the heart of France. The resulting delay allowed the main French army to get ahead of them and block their road to safety near the little village of Agincourt. <laughs> The French feasted on into the night, completely confident of the outcome. They outnumbered the English army many times. In stark contrast, Henry's army was cold and hungry, and probably more than a little frightened. The dawn broke misty and cold. It had rained all night, adding to the Englishman's misery and discomfort. The date was October the 25th, 1415. The small English army marched slowly towards the French and formed up. Henry knew his army well and set his battle plans to take advantage of his soldiers' abilities and the ground. They had little choice. To get home, they had to win. Trained from childhood, hardened by constant practice, English, Welsh and Scottish archers could pull heavy bows and shoot arrows far, fast and accurately. But even in such hands, could a simple wooden bow really defeat armies of highly trained warriors? Warriors well protected with expensive and sophisticated armour? The Battle of Agincourt, fought nearly 600 years ago, is perhaps the most surprising and emphatic. The French knew all about the power of the longbow. They'd carefully developed a campaign plan to defeat it. But things didn't work out quite as they'd expected. The battlefield at Agincourt was wet and newly ploughed. The English lines of archers, with men-at-arms set between them, extended to the woods at either side. 
the length of the English line and the way the army was deployed was to be crucial. As part of Henry's plan for the battle, he had ordered his archers to cut thick wooden stakes, sharpened at one end and then set them in the soft ground pointing at the French army a short distance away over the muddy field. This was something the archers would have been used to. It was a crucial part of the battle plan. The stakes were vital. The simple but brilliant idea was to create an almost impenetrable first line of defense against the French cavalrymen's horses. At first, the French refused to attack. Time was on their side. The English, in an attempt to provoke a response, had to advance further towards the French lines, pulling out the stakes and then resetting them back into the mud, much closer to the enemy. The archers, wet and cold, continued the task. On the flanks, near the woods, the last of the stakes were set into the ground and the remaining archers moved into place with as much purpose as their tired bodies could muster. With their stakes almost in place, they began preparing their bows and arrows for the battle. Every detail was checked, arrowheads, bows and bowstrings. The bows, damp from the rain, were dried and tested. The French still waited to attack. They could choose their time. The English tried to make the French attack. Their whole plan depended on it. Perhaps a ranging shot from an English archer was enough to provoke the French cavalry into action. The French horses were becoming harder to control. Eventually, perhaps because the archers had found the range, the French knights were at last forced into the attack. The flower of French chivalry charged forward over the muddy ground towards the English line, still believing it dominated the battlefield. But the English archers waited, biding their time until they could make every arrow count. And when they judged the knights were close enough, the archers finally raised their bows and loosed their arrows and loosed again and again. The sky blackened with thousands of arrows and they rained down on knights and horses. The majority of the French cavalry were shot to pieces floundering in the slippery mud the highly professional English archers continued to shoot. The cavalry charge was now hopeless. Wounded horse crashed into wounded horse, more and more out of control. As the few French knights that reached the English lines were shot at point-blank range, the rest turned and charged into their own advancing foot soldiers, also slowed by the terrible conditions. Isolated knights were unhorsed and savagely killed with blows from mallets or axes. The French foot soldiers continued their slow advance towards the English lines. With so many of them on the battlefield, they were forced together, unable to wield their weapons as they plodded blindly forward towards the English archers. They were easy targets. As they fell dead and wounded into the soft mud, the men behind stumbled over them, adding to the confusion. There was no protection or escape from the unrelenting arrow storm released by the English archers. The young English king fought hand to hand alongside his men. The French living and the French dead got in each other's way. huge army had been brought to its knees by a small, determined force. <laughs> 
Between five and 10,000 French were killed, yet fewer than 100 of the English army perished. An astonishing feat, remembered to this day and commemorated in Shakespeare's play Henry V. We few, we happy few, we band of brothers. It's very difficult to be sure just how effective an individual archer was against armoured knight. But in mass, they were deadly. And they were deadly in part because they were disciplined. And with that discipline, with those artisan skills, came a pride of craft and a sense of caste. They were professionals. They were fighting because they were well paid. And with that professional streak came a merciless edge. When Henry V decided to kill French prisoners during the Battle of Agincourt, the knights wouldn't do it. They wouldn't kill unarmed knights like them. But the archers did. It was simply part of the job. They probably had no great affection for knights on their own side or anybody else's. For the English archer, it was just a job. They were professional soldiers. But whether you were a soldier or someone who just used the longbow to hunt, you couldn't shoot well unless you practiced. Historians now believe that one of the reasons England had the best archers in Europe was because of a series of laws imposed by a succession of medieval kings that commanded men of all ages to practice with the longbow. Archers weren't like the peasant foot soldiers that constituted the bulk of medieval infantry. They're the artisans of the battlefield. They're well trained and they're well paid. They've also got the prospect of making money on the side by, by loot and prize money. So the men have some status and some stature uh, and can go back home, all being well, to live relatively comfortably. Um, but because they're a threat to their social superiors, they're not a system which lots of European monarchs are keen to imitate. Because a man like this, with his longbow in his hand and his arrows in his belt, needs handling slightly carefully when you get him back home. The strength of these medieval longbowmen can perhaps be glimpsed in this modern archer. Constant practice from childhood has developed his muscles. His strength was tested using a bow with a draw weight of only about 30 kilograms, much less powerful than many medieval bows. When the left hand is held rigid and the hand holding the bow is steady and straight, the force exerted across the back is around five times the draw weight of the bow. So the total force exerted on this archer's back when he's drawing a 30 kilogram bow is around 150 kilograms. With their heavier bows, medieval archers would have had to cope with much more. Seasoned archers back from a foreign campaign were just the men to coach young bowmen. English kings had been quick to see the advantages of a ready supply of well-trained men who could be called upon at short notice to fight in the frequent wars in France. The laws governing practice were strict. Some games and pastimes were actually forbidden to ensure all men, and especially young men, trained to become part of an elite corps of archers. Modern archers, admittedly using less powerful bows, can shoot at least 12 arrows every minute. The archers at Agincourt must have had a huge supply of ammunition. For medieval campaigns, arrows were needed not in thousands, but in hundreds of thousands, even millions, because it was the density and ferocity of the arrow storm that made the bow so dominant and effective. Each arrow had to be made and then transported to the field of battle. How on earth did they manage it? But manage it they did, for there are few, if any, records of supplies of arrows running out at a crucial moment in a battle. The bow itself is just a spring that throws the arrow. It's the arrow that does the damage. It is a complex and sophisticated projectile. To make an arrow, you start with a billet of wood which is slowly and carefully planed into a circular shape. The knock, the part where the bowstring fits, is reinforced with horn to prevent the shaft splitting when the arrow is shot. <laughs> 
There are three feathers on each arrow, all from either the right or left wing of the bird. These ensure the arrow's stability in flight. Each bird has only six of the sort of feathers required, so the number of birds needed to supply arrows for an army must have been enormous. One side of the feather is removed from the quill, the rest is used to make what is called the fletching of the arrow. Almost all the illustrations of medieval arrows show them with white feathers. First they are roughly shaped and cut to length, then they are glued and bound to the shaft. The natural curve of the feathers spins the arrow, making it more stable and accurate. Even with practice, this is a difficult and time-consuming process. In the Middle Ages, there must have been a highly organized but simple production line to meet the demand for the millions of arrows needed to keep the archers well supplied in battle. Most parts of the world, including Asia, used the bow and made their own particular version of arrows. This traditional Indian arrow is superbly decorated. Early 19th century Chinese arrows used the large wing feathers of eagles and were longer than European arrows because they were drawn back well beyond the ear. All arrow makers made different arrowheads for specific purposes, like this lethal medieval English one for hunting. Other heads were specially designed to penetrate plate and mail armor. Indian heads, characteristically, were often elaborately chiseled. Wherever they were made in the world, the arrow makers seemed to find similar solutions in designing arrowheads. This Chinese arrow and this one from Japan have simple pointed heads for practice. They belong to a very different Eastern tradition of archery. In the East, bows were often not made of wood or just of wood. Japanese bows, for instance, are usually made of bamboo, a giant grass. This ancient Egyptian bow is made of a number of pieces of wood and horn. And on the steppes of Central Asia, enormous grasslands where trees were not plentiful, this idea of composite bows was developed, using not only wood and horn, but also other elastic and resilient materials. This bow is a Mongolian bow. At first sight, it looks relatively simple. But in fact, it's a highly developed weapon. It's extremely flexible. It's reflexed away from the archer before the bowstring is put on, thus increasing the tension when it is strung. This is a composite bow. That's to say, it's composed of various different components. Its belly is of horn, usually from a buffalo, but sometimes from goat and sheep and its back was made of sinew. Running through the centre of the whole bow is a core of wood, or sometimes bamboo, which thickens to form these ears at either end. It's important because with this weapon, the Mongolians were able to dominate the then known world. When the bow is fully stretched, the ends of the bow bend in towards the archer. The archer aims and releases the string, and the bow tries to spring back into its unstrung shape. The ears at the bow end flick, giving the arrow additional propulsion. As wood was scarce on the Asian steppes, eastern bow makers had to use their ingenuity to make their bows. One rich source of raw materials was animals. Here we have a buffalo horn. The horn has to be cut into strips to form the belly of the bow. To make the glue adhere better, it has to be grooved in longitudinal stripes so that it doesn't weaken the horn. When the horn has been assembled to the wooden core, sinew soaked in glue is laid along the length of the bow. This provides the strength for tension. 
The glue used is very special. It's made from swim bladders of fish. It's very flexible and very long lived. However, it is a water based glue and when the bow has been finished, in order to protect it, it is necessary to cover the sinew layer. And this is usually done with birch bark. It's a perfect waterproof covering. Sometimes this covering was coloured and lacquered too, but mostly with the Asian bows, the birch bark fulfills just that function of waterproofing. It's not a decoration. The people who made this bow were extremely skilled craftsmen. In later times, whole guilds of bowyers existed with many apprentices doing all the, the heavy hard work. The bow, in my opinion, is the best bow that ever existed. It certainly would outshoot any simple wooden bow, both for distance and penetration. But there were other bow making traditions in the East using different materials. In Japan, the famed samurai warrior fought with sword and bow. The Japanese bamboo bow was also shot from horseback, but it was of a very unusual shape, the lower limb of the bow being shorter than the upper limb. Typical of the nation's approach, there is a ceremony attached to the bow's use, where the spiritual is combined with the military ethos of the weapon. There are eight stages in shooting the Japanese bow and great stress is laid on this ritual. The Japanese archer believed accuracy was most important and restricted himself to a few carefully aimed shots. Kyudo, the way of the bow, is a discipline celebrated in Japan today. Every spring, Japan celebrates a tradition that is hundreds of years old. The festival takes place in the spectacular scenery at the Nikko to Shogu Shrine, renowned for its beauty and air of peace. The shrine is one of the most famous in Japan and is designated a national treasure. Among the 55 buildings are superb carvings and statues of archers. Today, a very special form of mounted archery called yabusami is still practiced at the shrine and is performed as a sacred rite. Training begins in the gymnasium, where novice archers practice first on a wooden horse, aiming their bow at a soft target. The reality of yabusami is far more testing. Shooting at a small cedar wood target from a galloping horse is a test of riding and shooting skills, needing considerable physical and spiritual concentration by the archer. In Japan, Yabusami developed as a noble courtly pastime. It survives as a reminder of the importance to this and all Asian cultures of the bow as a hunting weapon and a weapon of war. For thousands of years, the horse archers of the Asian steppes dominated the continent. But this dominance was surely based, like the skills of the English archer, upon constant practice. For without practice, day in and day out, the strength, balance and coordination required to undertake the very difficult task of drawing and shooting a bow swiftly and accurately from a galloping horse could not be maintained. The Asian composite bow was one of the most successful weapons the world has ever seen, but only in the hands of an expert horseman, who was also a highly skilled archer. The training sessions begin with the formal dressing, starting with the woven and lacquered bamboo hats, the kishigasa. The shape of these date from the middle of the 18th century, when Yabusami enjoyed a revival in Japan. The priests bind their wrists with leather thongs. Yabusami archers shoot arrows with bulbous tips. They are derived from whistling arrows which make an eerie sound when they are shot. The placing of these arrows in the correct position is crucial as they need to be drawn quickly and shot rapidly on the day. <laughs> 
the practice session continues on the wooden horse. Here, the Yabusami archer begins to experience a disorientating movement designed to focus his attention on himself and his bow. The spiritual aspect is vital. The speed at which the real archery takes place needs considerable mental application. Even in the training stages, the priest is careful to move slowly and not feel rushed or lose his concentration. He must feel at one with the target, so there is no distance between him and it. Practicing without the reins is the first test. The ritual cry sets the horse going, and the archer carefully aims and shoots his bow. Next, the trickiest movement, drawing another arrow in one deliberate move before aiming again. If these actions are not fully harmonized, the chances of hitting the target are remote. The Japanese believe the twang of a bowstring and the whistle of the arrow chases away evil spirits. And the ritual cries are designed to drive demons away. A spring festival procession makes its way towards the shrine to commemorate its foundation. Yabusami riders and attendants, officials, local dignitaries, priests and visitors dressed in sumptuous traditional costumes make their way up the hill. Since Yabusami was introduced to the shrine in 1953, growing numbers of visitors have been attracted to this unique event. The archers make their way to the course. Each rider wears special ceremonial robes which derive from early hunting clothes. Each garment has its own significance. The legs are tied with braided silk and the hands are covered with soft doeskin gloves secured at the wrist. Deerskin chaps protect the legs. A padded silk sleeve protects the arm from the bowstring. The sword tied round the archer's waist is the traditional weapon of the samurai warrior. It's a great honor to participate in Yabusami, and as the moment approaches, the tension is mounting. The event begins with the reading of a prayer, asking the gods to protect the archers who will perform Yabusami. The first rider opens the festival holding the ceremonial fan. The fan signals the track is clear and purified of bad spirits. The first run begins. The archer must be galloping before he can draw and shoot as the fan falls to the ground. There are three targets, about 70 meters apart and about three meters from the track. They are very difficult to hit. The rider's style and speed are considered by the judges. The rider has to stand in his stirrups throughout. He's really in a standing crouch, knees wide apart and heels gripping the horse's sides. It's a very tricky technique to master. The next rider sets off shouting, in yo, an invocation to aid his concentration. The cedarwood targets are made even more difficult to hit in the grey afternoon and a typically seasonal downpour of rain. The reward is a silk sash referring symbolically to the deeds of the great samurai archers of the past. To hit the target, the bow must be high and vertical. The arrows are collected. The draw must be with the whole body, not just the arms. This is the ancient and sacred art of Japanese Yabusami. Shinto priests practice the spiritual and mental disciplines that continue to make Yabusami both a distinctive and unique form of mounted archery. In one concentrated and intense moment, body and spirit combine in the archer's mind to shoot a perfect arrow.
months of methodical practice, learning the difficult skills of drawing and shooting the special Japanese bow come to fruition in a brief moment. To shoot when bow and body are in precisely the right balance to hit the target. And at the end of the short run, a time to reflect. Yabusami, with its combination of mental and physical energy, echoes the special qualities the samurai warriors valued. In Europe, there was generally a more pragmatic view of weapons and warfare. And so in the Middle Ages, the longbow gave way to the crossbow. It was inherently more powerful and it was much easier to use. It was the mercenary crossbowman as much as the knight who dominated the battlefields of medieval Europe. But the crossbow was a very ancient weapon in use in China for centuries before the birth of Christ. The crossbow may look very different from the handheld bow, but in fact it's doing exactly the same job in a slightly different way. The arm of the archer is replaced by a wooden stock or tiller, and the archer's fingers by some form of lock mechanism. Now, this sort of crossbow has been used in Europe since the Dark Ages, and indeed used right up to the beginning of this century. This is a replica of what we now know as a peg and hole crossbow. It's about the simplest type of crossbow action that you can find. Here, the spanned string is held in its band position by a transverse groove across the stock. And when the time comes to shoot, it's pushed out of that groove by a peg operated by a simple lever trigger. It looks simple. Indeed, it is simple but a great deal of sophisticated thought has gone into creating this apparent simplicity. Soon, other trigger mechanisms were developed. In the most common medieval type, a single lever controls the movement of the nut, a cylindrical piece made from the hardest part of deer antler. The bowstring is drawn over the nut, where it is held in place until ready to shoot. The mechanism is simple and easy to maintain. In time, it was used on nearly all European crossbows. Early medieval crossbows were made, like the longbow, from wood. The increasing strength of the bow made hand drawing more difficult, so mechanical systems were devised to span it. Once loaded, the crossbow became a powerful and dangerous weapon, and it was perhaps the ease of shooting and its massive power that gave the crossbow a rather doubtful status. The crossbow had a rather bad reputation, at least in England. And in part, that's because it was relatively simple to use. So anybody could pick it up and be reasonably effective quite quickly. Whereas with a longbow, you needed almost to be bred to use it. So people often looked down on the crossbow. In fact, it had some advantages. Uh, you could keep it spanned so that you were ready to shoot very quickly. It, it was easy to use in a castle, and a longbow was sometimes rather difficult. Its real problem was that, by and large, it took much longer to reload. The limited training needed by a crossbowman to use this weapon was, for some commanders, a positive advantage. Almost anyone could shoot one. New and better improvements in the design continued, so its domination on the European battlefield far outweighed any perceived lack of status. The windlass crossbow, with a very strong steel bow, needed rope and a series of pulleys to draw the bowstring into position. But it was slow to load, and the bowman needed to understand how to repair it if it went wrong. There was also an awkward routine to follow that involved the slackening and tensioning of the winding system. That needed concentration, and for the bowman, most of his efforts were focused on the spanning. However, once the weapon was spanned, the crossbow could be shot and then reloaded. One of the problems for the crossbowman was the weight of all the equipment he had to carry with him. 
his bow, the arrows or quarrels, personal weapons, daggers and swords, along with his body armor and spanning devices. But he could only fight effectively if he had all this gear to hand. And there was one other essential item of the crossbowman's equipment. Everywhere he went, he carried his own defense, a large shield called a pavise. This was for protection when he was on the battlefield. Once he'd shot his crossbow, he was at his most vulnerable during the reloading process. But protected by his pavise, he was relatively safe from enemy fire and so could operate from close range. The crossbow, although sometimes unwieldy, was now too useful a weapon to abandon. Here were two weapons, the crossbow and the English longbow. Different weapons shot by quite different types of men. The real social differences between archers who use the longbow and crossbowmen. The longbow depended upon a social system. It depended upon long training and hard use. The crossbow, widely used in Europe, was typically used by the mercenary. It was often attractive for European monarchs who didn't want to take the social risk of training their peasants to use the longbow to hire crossbowmen for a particular job and to pay them off when the job was done. The longbow was also relatively easy to make, whereas the crossbow wasn't. So once you'd trained peasants to use the longbow, they then got the raw materials readily to hand. The crossbow was far more mechanically complex, not the sort of thing which a peasant, however clever, was going to put together in his hut. The longbow archer was trained from boyhood and was part of a civilian population which could quickly become a body of effective fighting men. In this practical test, the speed and fluidity of the archer, shooting between 12 and 16 arrows a minute, contrasts with the much slower rate of the crossbowman. But this is only part of the story. In many parts of Europe, unlike Britain, the crossbow was the major battlefield weapon. The longbow was not such an important part of the European military system, where the crossbow continued to be developed and its performance improved. Composite crossbows were very hard-hitting weapons, using horn and sinew to form a very powerful bow. They used a combination of different skills, technologies and diverse production processes to achieve their remarkable results. Just as the Asian bow was made from composite materials, so too in Europe, at least from the time of the Crusades, around the 13th century, a crossbow was made which was also constructed with a composite bow. Of course, for a crossbow, it's unwieldy if the bow is of the same length as a hand bow. So a very much thicker, shorter drawed bow had to be made. It was made from the same basic materials as the oriental bow. That is to say, horn, sinew and sometimes wood. The construction of these crossbows took many, many months. At least six months to make a light crossbow and probably a year to make a heavy one. Crossbow-like machines shooting arrows and spanned with a windlass system had been well known since Roman times and they had come to be a major influence on the development of the smaller handheld crossbows. The ballista was essentially a siege machine with a fairly good range and a built-in spanning system. As small crossbows became more powerful, more ingenious spanning systems had to be developed. Probably one of the most ingenious was the Kranequin. A strong steel bow needed a very powerful mechanism to span the bowstring, but one that was easy to operate. The principle of the Kranequin is the same as that of a modern carjack. <laughs> 
where a small amount of effort produces a great deal of energy. It's also one of the first recorded uses of reduction gearing. The whole process of cutting and shaping the gears was a very time-consuming exercise. Accurately cutting the teeth by hand so that they interlocked must have been extremely difficult. But those medieval crossbow makers did, and the Kranachrin remains probably the most sophisticated spanning method ever produced. But if the Kranachrin broke down in battle, it would be impossible to repair in the field and could leave the crossbowman defenseless. In England, the crossbowman never enjoyed the status or recognition of the yeoman archer. But as a weapon, the crossbow was highly rated for defending castles, with an enviable reputation for power and efficiency. One pope had even tried to ban the weapon as an instrument of the devil. What had begun as a relatively simple, though clever device, became the most important projectile weapon of the Middle Ages, used extensively for hunting and for war. Even with the invention and gradual improvement of firearms, crossbows continued in widespread use, and perhaps more surprisingly, continued to develop into new forms of increasing sophistication. A very distinctive form appeared in Tudor England, and by the 17th century, hunting bows were in use that had cheek stocks and locks with set triggers to improve aim, just like the most advanced and expensive sporting guns. And indeed, the sports of target shooting and hunting with crossbows have never entirely disappeared. The modern crossbow still has the powerful qualities of its earlier forebears. It's a very efficient weapon. It's still used for target shooting and hunting. Its power and silence make it attractive to the police, the military, and to terrorists. But now, as in the past, the crossbow is perhaps more feared than loved. It has never acquired the legendary status or respect achieved by the great medieval English longbow. <laughs>